Res Arcana. This is a game that came out, I believe, in 2019, before the pandemic, but I think it's because of the pandemic and the chaos that followed. I kind of missed it. I didn't play it back then, and then again, a lot happened, and I finally, finally managed to play it. I know there are a lot of reviews out there by now. This game is pretty popular. Uh, I think it is. It is pretty much on its way to become a modern classic, at least a modern gateway classic in the, just in the same vein of Takenoko or Ticket to Ride. But in case you want to watch yet another video review, but this one with my mellifluous voice, here we go, my video for Res Arcana. Competitive game in which players will uh, take control of mages, each player will have a mage that represents them in the game. Each mage has a special ability at the bottom, and some mages also have a collect ability that will be used during the collect phase, and we see what that means. The game can be played in different modes, different variants, so generally speaking, usually you will have a number of mages that you receive randomly, and you select one, you place it face up in front of you, and that represents you in the game. The general idea is that then you will uh, collect resources, you will use artifact cards, magic items, monuments, place of power, they will form your tableau, they will form your engine, and then you will use the uh, abilities indicated on these components to trigger effects. Many effects uh, will require you to tap a card, um, um, I mean, I mean, uh, to turn a card, and then at the end of the turn you untap your card, um, by which I mean you straighten your card. We don't want to get any angry worded emails from the wizards, right? So, uh, many effects will allow you to do things by spending the card away or by discarding... Uh, tokens, uh, the tokens uh, have, they're not water, fire, or what just you think they are, the other things like calm, elan, death, uh, life, and gold, that gold is always good. So, you'll have these resources, collect, spend, use effects, uh, and all of this you're doing pretty much to place cards in your personal area, that cards or tiles, that have numbers written in this red symbol here. That number is the number of victory points that that component is worth. Uh, whenever, at the end of a turn, a player has 10 victory points, Catan style, they win the game. If more than one player collects 10 points at the end of the same turn, then the player who has the most, the highest past 10, if still a tie, then you look at the resources, and whoever has the most resources in their personal pool uh, wins the game. So, I know it's a little bit of a vague thing, but that's because the game is very sandboxy, because different components will give you different abilities, allowing you to collect more tokens, to play more cards, and, and that is awesome, because the game can go in many different ways. There are so many different ways in which you can go to those 10 points. Artifact cards, super important. Each player will have a personal deck of eight cards, very minimalistic. And again, different variants will allow you to uh, to handle this in different ways. It may be that you simply uh, draw them randomly from the deck, everybody gets eight cards and that's it. And I, I find that a little bit dangerous. Lady Luck can have a role that maybe is a little too strong here, giving somebody big, big good synergies and not so much to somebody else. The variant I like the most is drafting, card drafting. Everybody gets eight cards, so choose one, actually, actually it's in two rounds. Everybody gets four, choose one, pass the other ones to the other players, receive the other ones, choose another one, pass it around and so on, and then you repeat with other four cards until everybody again has a deck of eight cards. So you will start your game with a mage card, a deck of eight cards, three go in your starting hand, one resource of each kind in your personal pool, and also a magic item. They are these uh, tiles here, and I suppose that this is the one that I start from, and I think uh, I'm good to go now. So, at the beginning of each, uh, and this is my time, right? At the beginning of each uh, round, 
players will look at all of, all of the symbols, all the kind of symbols, the grabby hand that they have in their personal area. And they collect the resources indicated. The druid gives me a life. This one gives me a calm or an elan, or also known as a blue or a red token. And I simply take the corresponding resources and I place them in my personal pool. As simple as that for the collection phase that everybody can resolve at the same time. Then players will alternate taking turns. And each turn, this is cool, is only one action. So it should go pretty fast, but some actions are pretty powerful. You have to do a couple of things. And sometimes you want to think about your action. And there really isn't an, an interaction between, between turns. So when other players are taking their turn, lucky enough, it's only one action because you're not really doing anything. What are the actions that I may be taking? I may be playing an artifact in my personal play area, in which case I need to discard the corresponding resources, as simple as that. That can be modified by a plethora of effects, but suppose I just pay the full price and that's it. I can also, for my action for the turn, activate a card by, tap, by, by turning it, in this case, for example, this will allow me to unturn, to straighten a card, a card in my tableau that has the animal symbol. I don't have any right now, but uh, who knows, maybe I will soon after I look at my hand and I don't. Doesn't matter. Or again, for my action for the turn, I activate an action on my visible cards. For example, this card gives me two options. One is requires me to turn the card, which spends it for the round, and I would spend three Elan to place a dragon card at zero cost. Or I could spend two fire to Elan to place three Elan on the card. And this is important because if a card gives me an effect uh, that places Tokens in my personal supply, I can use them right away. If the effect places the resources on a card, then I will collect them the following round during the collecting phase. When again, I'm looking at these icons, and yes, I can also pick up uh, resources that are on my cards. A very important resource is gold. My action for the turn, if I was able to collect four gold, may be to pick up a monument. We have a deck of monuments, two are available face up. I can collect either of them by spending four gold, they all have the same cost, or I can draw a random one from here, and then I simply add it to my tableau. And again, that uh, may give me different kinds of advantages on top of giving me different points. Again, possible actions by turning the card. Places of power, very powerful. Also, double-sided for more variety. Here's the cost, so they can be pretty expensive. And again, they will give you three points, and they will give you different kinds of different kinds of abilities. This one is really good, but there's a curse during the collection phase. You had to pay a death or tap a card, tap an artifact. Uh, tap whatever component you have, uh, you can spend a lot in gold to place gold on it, and the more gold is on it, the more victory points you score at the end. Just an example of what some of these can do. Yeah, you do have to learn a little bit of Iconese to play this game, but not too much. The Iconese is fairly intuitive in most cases. So tap and spend an Elan to get 5 life, for example. Spend 5 five death to put a death on the scar, which is important, it gives you a victory point. And this effect doesn't turn the card, so I can do it as many times as I want, as long as I have those uh, death tokens. So turn it and place another death token. The Catacomb. Catacomb of the death. As opposed to the Catacombs of the happy living people that are partying all day. Seems a bit redundant, but I'm just being annoying. So, the general idea remains uh, that you are performing these actions to place components in your tableau to, call, to then be able to get better cards to collect those points. A very important action is to take a card from your hand and discard it. It is recommended that you discard it face up, tucking it under your, your pile, 
your draw path so you also to sure that you're not mixing your you know mistaking your discard pile for your uh, for your tableau and when you do that you can collect any two resources or a gold gold is usually a little harder to to come by very 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 important action so this is the general idea perform actions placing stuff in your tableau activating things in your tableau discarding cards to collect resources from time to time you'll have an ability that allows you to react to, to what other people are doing but for example they attack with their dragons have an effect of forcing you to discard life you may have abilities that prevent that from happening but generally speaking um, it's not a highly interactive game. Continue this way until a player has 10 points at the end of a round, unless there is somebody uses this ability here to check it before the end of a round, and that can create some really tense situation. But the default idea is first player to have 10 victory points in their play area at the end of the round wins the game. Resarcana is pretty impressive. I do believe it's gonna, in 10 years from now, it's gonna be one of those classic gateway games. Again, Carcassonne Ticket to Ride, Splendor. Because it has all of those nice qualities. It draws you in with a very minimalistic set of rules, which basically is, you know, after you collect from all the icons, take an action. And they are all right there. All the icons are telling you what you can do. You have a hand of cards which is not that big, so it's not overwhelming. It draws you in very quickly, and you kind of start figuring out the strategies early on. Uh, but then it draws you in further because after you started playing with these core mechanics, you see the expanding depth and all the possibilities. So it's a perfect gateway game because it's not threatening at the beginning. And once you're in, it opens up so many different paths to victory, so many different strategies. It also has several hooks there. Somebody who has played Magic the Gathering may see similarities, mainly in the theme, in some of the, the general design of the cards or the topic, or the resources, but it also works. There's nothing wrong. But at the same time, the game actually plays very different. Again, it feels more like Splendor in a sense because of collecting different things, the Sentry games. Um, it almost also reminds me of Love Letter because of the idea of the very minimalistic deck of cards. It has a certain family resemblance with many games that we have been playing in the hub in the last 10, 15 years. And yet it is so much its own thing. It is so... Uh, it has such a strong personality and identity. And I really appreciate more than anything uh, the variety of gameplay that's such a tight game. It's darn tight, man, so tight. But the variety of gameplay that, that it allows, it, it's really impressive. You can go all aggro with just putting the emphasis on one main strategy. I got cards, uh, my mage and cards that produce death and I'm gonna dump them in the catacomb and that's gonna score me a lot of points or I'm gonna diversify more and try it so with a mid-range kind of thing, two places of power um, that will build up a slow engine that will pay off a lot, will snowball later. Ooh, then I'm gonna get the card that allows me to end the game a little earlier because I'm trying to prevent your snowballing. So many different paths to victory. But again, I do believe you need to play with the draft variant uh, because uh, then you have more agency and you only have eight cards. And if somebody's lucky and gets a better deck of artifacts, better than you, I think right there, the situation may be a little bit uh, slanted there. Now, caveat, I played the game only with two players and I love it. And I think... I'm gonna play that way. Uh, I don't know, maybe friends are over at some point, we decide to give it a try, but I don't have any desire the, the, this, of playing it with three or four players. The experience is so tight, it's so neat this way. And there are still, I would call them power turns, in which you play a card and you do something, uh, a certain effect. Um, Especially not so much during gameplay, during the general thing, but at some point uh, players may decide to pass. And there's a big incentive because passing first gives you the first player's token, which also is worth a point and then may win you the game. 
but that means that passing earlier than the other player or players may still have a couple of things. They did okay, I'm gonna spend this thing to untap, to straighten a card, and then I'm gonna use it again to get something. I spend that something and I get a card, which I then use. Um, if it's a two-player game, uh, you pass early, I take basically the, the, the equivalent of three, four, five turns in a row. That's not a big deal. But if there are the three players that are doing that, I think it'll get a little bit boring. And again, generally speaking, uh, there may be downtime as players are thinking about their strategy. This is just my um, hypothesis, so to speak. Again, I want to clarify, I'm not, I have not played with three or four players. I just don't have the strong of a desire to do so because I think downtime may become a problem. Um, and you know, because people will want to think about their their strategy. And really there isn't a lot of interaction. Um, from time to time somebody will do something and I will react to that. But it's not that I'm going to think about that a lot. Um, I see you have collected all the resources for a certain place of power. Chances are you're going to uh, go for it. And after I figured it out, I say, yay, I may or may not be able to stop you. Probably not if I was thinking about my strategy. Um, so even if you see what other people are doing, there are really a lot of ways of interacting. So it feels pretty much a multiplayer solo, which again, that's not a problem whatsoever if you had two players only, but there's no reason for you to be uh, engaged with what other players are doing or very, very few reasons. So. I like it as a two-player game. I play that way. I'm satisfied with it, and and and, and I feel confident to recommend it as a two-player game for sure. It's tight. It's so rich in strategy and in options. So many different things that you can do. Uh, it's really remarkable that a game that at the core is so simple, play what you have and use what you have, uh, and then it and then the cards are self-explanatory. A game so simple is also so rich and has so much variety and so many interesting choices. It does not hurt that the art is really attractive, that those tokens are fun to manipulate, so that generally speaking the production values are very high. So very happy with Res Arcana. I may be late to the party, but I think this game has been is gonna be uh, one of those two go games, I think it's going to be in a visible place, convenient place on the shelf so they can be pulled off the shelf. I think it's going to see some game table and again I think it's going to be part of the rotation. Once my friends know how to play it, it can even be a bit of a extended filler, two play extended filler between larger games. But definitely I'm very happy, very pleased with Res Arcana.